This is concerning. Tiny Tina's Wonderlands hasn't even been out for a month and the player base has dropped dramatically. I genuinely enjoy the end game stuff, but the game as a whole still needs many additions slash fixes. The next patch needs to hit hard in a positive way. That is a tweet that Jolt's dude sent out. And when Jolt sent these tweets out, you know it's serious. Even notorious Gearbox simp, Epic NNG, couldn't hold back his feelings either. This is honestly how I feel too. I've sunk 300 plus hours into this game so far and have really loved it, but the latest hotfix has genuinely squashed my passion I had for this game. I'm really hoping the patch does something great because right now I'm just not feeling it. Now, what are these two content creators talking about and what am I gonna be talking about to you guys today? Basically, I'm gonna go over all of the things that I think Gearbox needs to change about Wonderlands if they don't want the player base to die off. We're gonna talk about standalone raid bosses, we're gonna talk about loot luck, and a tip I have that I think could honestly fix loot luck, fix loot luck tremendously, um, and some of the other stuff in the game, uh, even stuff like the end game content, uh, and just, you know, them not bringing back certain things that make a Borderlands game a Borderlands game, you know, certain things they forgot about uh, when making this game. And uh, yeah, so let's just get straight into it. Now, the first thing we're gonna talk about in this video is the end game content, the chaos chamber and the four raid bosses you can unlock within it. This is awesome end game content. I have no complaints about what exists, but what I do want to talk about is what doesn't exist. And what doesn't exist in this game is standalone raid bosses. And the thing about this is that I feel like they've learned this lesson with Borderlands 3. You know, given the fact that at the beginning of Borderlands 3's life cycle, they literally said, we are not releasing standalone raid bosses. It's a different direction we're taking with this game. And then by the last DLC, they released a standalone raid boss. And that is something that does not exist in this game. You can only unlock the raid bosses via the Chaos Chamber. Now, the reason why this is a problem actually has to do with the lucky uh, dice situation in a weird way, and it's not how you think. And that's because the problem with the lucky dice is there's so many of them, but what I feel like the devs were going for with the lucky dice is they wanted you to explore all of the amazing maps they created. And, uh, we, you know, as a Borderlands player, I love the maps that they create in this game. A lot of them are great and fun, but usually we lack reasons to return to these maps. And so I feel like one of the reasons for the lucky dice was to make us return to all these maps again and find all of them. Except that that is not the right approach. And now let's tie it back to the end game content. How come we are not having to travel through all of these maps to find our raid bosses? Now, obviously there's only three raid bosses um, that they would put outside of the chaos chamber. I think the maker should stay inside the chaos chamber since, she, since she's like a secret raid boss once you unlock all three in a row. And the point I'm trying to make is when there is good dedicated farming and good raid bosses and reasons to explore all of the maps via endgame content, then that is what's gonna make us come back to some of these beautiful maps. You know, go target farm these specific bosses, go target farm the raid bosses, instead of having to do the chaos chamber grind. The chaos chamber grind should be kind of relegated for once you have farmed up all of your gear, okay, now I wanna go complete the Chaos Chamber, you know, and get a good run. Get up on those time leaderboards for the featured run, or maybe now I wanna go take on the Maker where you fight all four bosses in a row. And I just think they can take the three uh, raid bosses from the Chaos Chamber and give them, you know, a portal to where you can access the fights from different maps uh, in the game, or even the overworld. I even think if the three raid bosses could be accessed from different areas in the overworld, um, or, you know, it would probably be much easier to just create a door in an existing map already, and then it just teleports you to the raid boss arena, and then from there you can save, quit, and target farm. That, that's pretty much my rant on endgame content. The thing about this game and its endgame content, um, actually, for those of you who played another Gearbox game called Godfall, I really feel like uh, the Chaos Chamber is a very similar reskin of what's going on in Godfall. Now, for those of you who haven't played Godfall, it was a game released by Gearbox uh, in works with a different publisher, so it wasn't created by Gearbox, but they helped 
you know, create it and publish it and stuff like that. And let me go ahead and just re read to you guys what Godfall, which was a looter slasher, because it was a looter shooter, but with melee weapons, so looter slasher. And let's just read what their Tower of Trials was. So, according to Hayne, in an interview with Gamebyte, once the main story is completed, a new mode will be available to fans in the monolith called the Tower of Trials. The Tower of Trials features roguelike gameplay that, like the other modes in the game, can be played solo or in co-op. The mode features combat trials with progressively difficult enemies, unique rewards as players progress, and earn keys to new floors, getting closer to the center of the monolith. Once the player leaves the mode, the progress gets reset to zero. Also, as players progress through the mode, new doorways will open up offering different rewards, giving players the options to choose different reward types based on what the doors are unlocked. Once the challenge behind the door is completed, players will earn the reward and can choose to keep going through the trial or exit the mode. And I'm sorry, but this just sounds so similar to the chaos mode in Borderlands 3, as well as some of the serpent enemies. It's kind of funny that Godfall had a lot of uh, serpent enemies, and that is a new type of enemy added in Wonderlands. Or did I say Borderlands 3 earlier? Wonderlands. Sorry, Force of Habit. But it just feels that the end game is getting a bit stale when there is only one location that you go to for the end game. Instead of traveling throughout the maps, you know, doing different dedicated farms, going somewhere to fight the raid boss alone, when, you know, maybe I want to test my build against raid boss damage, you know? I know my build can mob. I don't need to run through a chaos chamber to get to the raid boss. And uh, it's just it's just something that I really think they should have learned for Borderlands 3. And I posted a 40 minute video on Borderlands 3's failures. And in this video, we are revisiting some of those things and we're gonna go ahead and move on to the next topic. And that is the recent uh, patches and nerfs. Now, I know a lot of people are gonna say, Wah, you're crying about your OP liquid cooling? I can't believe you didn't know that was going to get nerfed. Yeah, I knew it was going to get nerfed. However, my point with balancing and nerfing in this game is that it should always be done before the content is released. Now, some people are going to say, you know, some things slip through the cracks. Of course, I am not complaining about things that slip through the cracks. But in my opinion, uh, when I know for a fact, you know, everybody knows it that there is a content creator team who receives early access to these games. And, uh, you know, they most likely provide feedback. Um, and I can also prove that to you if we go to a Borderlands 3 hotfix back when they nerfed Commitment. And once again, Commitment on Zane. For those of you who are Wonderlands players, Commitment was a kill skill, or I'm sorry, Wonderlands and not Borderlands 3. But Commitment was a kill skill on Zane that was bugged. And instead of only being able to stack twice like other kill skills, it could stack infinitely. Now, the problem I have with this nerf is this paragraph right here. Of course, the skill was overpowered. I'm not crying about that. What I am crying about is this. The intent for this skill was always to stack as many times as Zane other kill skills, which is twice. When its increased stacking was discovered last fall, we determined we would leave it as it wasn't causing catastrophic issues. As part of the balancing for the upcoming content, however, we have deemed it necessary for the stacks to be capped as originally designed. So when uh, this uh, DLC launch in particular, uh, there was a lot of release with content creators with very early access. For this DLC in particular, I believe, I don't remember exactly, but it was multiple weeks to a month um, because I received early access and I posted videos with the permission of Gearbox about these skill trees weeks before they came out. Um, and it was very well known that Commitment was stacking many, many times. Um, and for some reason, they decided to just literally leave it in the game. I don't know if this was laziness. I don't know if it was bad judgment, but there's just, it, this is just in bad taste and doesn't leave a good taste in players' mouths. And I also think there are certain tactics that developers try to go to to uh, kind of manipulate the emotions of their player base. Uh, you know, when these sort of nerfs and buffs come out, it's because they're trying to spice up the game. And I don't think there's a problem with that in particular, but when there's a gun like the liquid cooling that is obviously overpowered and, you know, I didn't receive early access with Wonderlands uh, because I'm not part of the content creator team anymore. And I did not 
leave my own feedback about the liquid cooling uh, to the developers. But if you are putting, gu you know, if you're creating and testing guns for a new game and you have a pistol that does a thousand damage with a 10.0 fire rate and the bullets reload on critical hits and you shoot that pistol and you don't immediately come to the conclusion that it's overpowered, then either the de the devs have shit tier builds and their liquid coolings weren't even doing damage, or it's just a heavy oversight um, that I kind of can't let go of because it's just following previous patterns that Borderlands 3 has already done. And uh, along with some of these other nerfs, uh, the Masterwork Hanbow got a nerf. Now I could even understand why this gun got a nerf, of course, uh, this gun is amazing with the uh, fadeaway action skill or from the shadows, whatever it's called in this game. Um, and this gun is very, very strong. So like maybe it can get a nerf, but it got a double nerf to the scaling itself and the crit damage on the card. And the liquid cooling got a 65% nerf. Some of this stuff is just way over tuned. Um, and then some of this is kind of irrelevant, like Catatumbo kind of got nerfed a little bit. Queen's Cry got nerfed a little bit. I'm sad about this one too, but it was only 15%. Pookie's Chew Toy, a quest reward Jacob's Pistol by 30%. Now, I could understand this because, you know, you can get this during a story playthrough. Maybe it was too strong for story playthroughs, but at the same time, it's very nice to have access to quest rewards that are very good for endgame builds because it adds spice to the endgame. I don't know if there's a workaround to satisfy both sides, but it's on there. The Ruby Spite uh, nerfed by 30%. I did not see one build with this gun heavily overperforming. Like, yeah, it's a good weapon, but I don't know. Anyways, that's all we have to talk about nerfs and buffs in this game. And I really told you guys all my thoughts on that. Now I wanna talk about the loot luck, loot lucky dice system. And I mentioned earlier in the video how the lucky dice system, I think is a mixture of um, making it so that new playthroughs don't have the same drop rates as, uh, you know, end game, which, I think that is fine, uh, but it was, I think they also introduced it to make you re-explore all of the maps and see every single inch of all of the maps because there are 260 loot dice between 15 maps. There's like 10 to 20 loot dice per map and it is a ridiculous amount. Personally, I didn't even collect them all on my first playthrough. I don't even know how much of this luck stuff is a myth because in Borderlands 3, uh, luck was almost a myth as soon as you turned on the chaos levels. Uh, but, you know, I'm not gonna get into that because I don't know the specifics of that because apparently uh, from all of the widespread information going around from early release content creators, you need to collect every piece of loot dice to have the full dedicated drop rate chance. And like I said, that makes sense from an early game to end game perspective. But uh, where that doesn't make sense to me is at the end game perspective, I literally need to collect 260 dice. Now, number one, I think this problem could be solved if we simply just removed like two thirds of the loot dice. If there were only a hundred loot dice in this game between the 15 maps, that's less than 10 per map. And I think the overworld might even make it 16. Anyways though, that's less than 10 per map and that is fully acceptable. And I don't think it was it would be as big of a deal would it still be slightly annoying you have to collect it on every character? Sure. But that's the other thing I'm gonna bring up is maybe the loot dice just needs to be a system where, uh, you know, every single main quest and side quest you do will lead you to a loot dice. So that way you don't have to go on a wild uh, Easter Sunday egg hunt on every single map, every single time you start a new character and maybe, you know, you can just collect them as you level up throughout the game. And they're just cool bonuses, like, you know, after a boss, when you go hit the chests, maybe there's a loot dice with those chests, and that would be a good combination. And then, you know, some side quests that you have to complete as well also have loot dice at the end. That way, it's not just the main story, you know, you have to have a certain amount of side quest completion, which will unlock all of your dedicated drop rates as well. And that would be a much better system, but instead it's, like I said, it's just an Easter Sunday egg hunt, like, and you know, we're all adults now. That was fun when we were kids, but how many of you guys do the egg hunts? It's more fun to hide the eggs for the kids to find. And you know, that's kind of what it feels like with the Gearbox developers, that there are parents hiding our eggs around and we gotta go find them all and roll them. 
And uh, yeah, so just those two tips, you know, just reducing the number dramatically or exclusively putting loot dice at the end of main quests or side quests. Now, finally, for the last part of the video, I just want to talk about bringing back things that people love and removing things that we already knew people hated. Now, I've already talked about a lot of the stuff people hated, stuff that they should have never brought back were the mayhem modifiers uh, to the chaos chamber from Borderlands 3 because everybody universally hated mayhem modifiers in Borderlands 3. Um, and then uh, the reroll economy with the enchantments. Obviously, I think we will see a change to that stuff. So I'm not really gonna talk about it too much or offer any tips because I actually do genuinely think they probably will change that at some point in a patch. Uh, but one, some stuff I wanna talk about is stuff they didn't bring back. Now, uh, one thing I actually got from a Vinylic uh, Puma video where I think he was actually talking about Borderlands 3 when I watched this video, but he mentioned how in Borderlands 2, once you got to Sanctuary and you came across Marcus and the target dummy, uh, and the mission that taught you, you know, which element is good against which and which element is bad against which, kind of like a rock, paper, scissors, which is in every Borderlands game element matching. That does not exist in Wonderlands either. Now, fortunately, the target dummies do exist in Wonderlands, uh, but there still could be some improvements to the base knowledge that you give play like new players and returning players. You know, uh, there are some new elements in Wonderlands. I didn't know exactly what the bonuses were, um, although you could look it up in the in the item parts, luckily. But I think enhancing this base knowledge that uh, you can give to new players, instead of them having to go find a guide on which element is good against which in Wonderlands, you know, there's already so many skills in the game that have unintended interactions or hidden effects or double dipping or this and that. And, you know, you can come to my YouTube videos for that stuff. But I don't want to post a YouTube video, and I'd never posted a YouTube video about element matching. And I think there is a certain level of base knowledge that needs to be given to the player that honestly crafts the sort of, uh, what's the right word for this? I don't want to say the culture, but the feeling, um, the depthness, you know, when you give a player base knowledge of element matching and how the rock, paper, scissors works, and other stuff in the game. There could have even been a mission that talked about lucky loot dice a little bit more and literally explained to you, hey, you want to watch out for every lucky loot dice. Because when I started my Wonderlands journey, I didn't know that. I found that out later from, you know, like a Jolt's tweet or something like that, where he was like, you have to collect every loot dice, you know, and I don't even know how true that is. So can the, can the developers tell us while, you know, in a mission while I'm playing the game, you know, how that stuff works? Also, bringing back things that people did love, like the Zero missions or the Hammerlock Hunt missions from BL3, um, you know, as, like kind of running side quest where you can, you know, and it would make sense because it would probably just go with the Obelisk bosses. Um, and then stuff like True Vault Hunter mode. Now, I know True Vault Hunter mode is not a make or break thing uh, in this video exactly, but it was nice to get a second playthrough on a character that you have fully leveled. And I know the point of True Vault Hunter mode is to do the second playthrough, but with scaling difficulty. Um, and the first playthrough already kind of does that. But there was also something nice about playing a second playthrough, uh, you know, on the max chaos mode with max difficulty starting from scratch. And it was kind of fun. Anyways, guys, that is it for this video. Let me know what you think or any comments you want to leave in the comment section down below. You guys know I show love and respond to all the comments. Also, please drop a like on the video and subscribe to the channel for more Wonderlands content. I'll see you guys in the next one. I'm out.